I had a video request to do a video on how I became debt free. So I'm going to do a real quick video here, just covering some of the basics. Um, <clears throat> I've been debt free most of my life and uh, learning to save money is the key to it and not spend money, okay, foolishly. Um, debt free as a teenager, um, when I was growing up, I did not get into debt. If I didn't have the money, I was taught if you don't have the money, then you don't buy it. It's just that simple. And so when I was in high school, I had an old car, a Plymouth Champ. <laughs> That's actually kind of a rare car now. Dodge Colt and Plymouth Champ. Well, I had a Plymouth Champ. And um, it was a beater car. I paid a couple hundred dollars for it. My first car was actually a Volkswagen Beetle. I paid uh, $75 for it and sold it for $250. Yeah, wish I had it. But uh, the got the Plymouth Champ. It was older. It had dings and dents and scratches and whatever and that thing was a beater car and I you know tried to increase uh, its destruction by the way I drove it and but it eventually was just nickel and diming me to death it was leaving me sit quite a bit um, and so I decided I would get another vehicle and I saw there was a guy that had a, a uh, 1987 Ford Ranger um, and I just had to have it. It was beautiful. It had a lift kit on it and everything else. It was an STX, you know, addition and, you know, Rancho suspension and 31 inch tires and everything else. And I just had to have that vehicle, but it was more than what I had. So I got into debt and, um, that began my time of being in debt. The only time that I was in debt actually. And so I got that and, um, I was paying that debt down. And then I got a, a Corvette after that, 1982 Corvette. And after that, um, I got a, went out and bought a brand new Yamaha Banshee in 1997. Um, I got some wood turning equipment and things, different tools, got into some debt there. But I worked hard, did some work for my father. Um, construction work you know they got another house and I was working on that place and um, that and I did some tree work to pay off my debt and he said you know you do this work I'll have to pay a contractor to do it so you do it and I'll pay you to do it I'll help you pay down that debt so that's what happened and uh, that's why I was with my parents for a while before I got married because I was doing work for them and whatever so um so I was debt free when I met my wife Okay. And unfortunately, I wasn't really working a whole lot because I was just studying. And at the time, I was a video game player, so I was playing a lot of video games. That's why I've rebuked video games, because I know from personal experience that they're a waste of your time. But um, nevertheless, I was doing that. And But I got married. My wife had a little bit of debt from her student loans. So we worked hard. We paid that off. And um, we were uh, asked to come to a place in northern Pennsylvania. I've talked about that in old studies. And they said, you can live at this old house for free. Uh, there's a reason for that because the place was literally falling down. Um, there was a huge bolt going through the house, big steel rod holding the walls together from falling out. Um, the ceiling fell down, collapsed onto our bed at one point in time. There were bats up in the attic, you know, fl flying around. One got down into the ceiling, was flying around in the drop ceiling and things, and mice running across the floors. Uh, the, the water was poisonous. Uh, good place, good times, you know. Um, uh, Pennsylvania there, northwestern Pennsylvania, they had done oil drilling and things, so the water, groundwater was uh, very much uh, toxic up in... Um, uh, Bradford it was near Eldred, Pennsylvania. Uh, we were actually our place that we were in. Um, the back part of the house was actually in New York. The front part was in Pennsylvania. So, kind of a unique situation. But we were there, and you know we got to stay there for free in exchange for helping out with the church, Country Chapel Baptist Church, and also their store. Um, and we built, my wife built their website for them. Um, I did all the video and photography work for the store and the church. And we built a website for their church as well. 
So, you know, it's not that we were just bums living there or something for free and some kind of welfare thing. No, we exchanged it for our work that we did. Things fell apart there. We moved. We were saying, what are we going to do? You know, what do we do for things? I was making some videos and posting them to YouTube. You can go back and see the old videos that I was doing. Some were actually shot from the old house that we were living in there. Um, did a study on head coverings and one on Mike Hoggard and eternal security. You can see those old videos, look at those. And so we went from uh, that, decided to move back down to my parents' property. I had a wood shop on the property and I said, you know, we'll get the wood working machinery out of there and we'll just live in my old wood shop uh, for a while till we can find a property, which is what we did. And we traveled all over Pennsylvania looking for properties with the little money that we had. Uh, we considered renting. We, you know, went down into the southern states a little bit looking for properties down there, Virginia, West Virginia. Um, it, you know, went all over the place. Up into New York State a little bit, looking at properties. And then somebody, you know, a Mainer, come out and said, why don't you move to Maine? And we went, Maine? You know, huh? And then we looked and we said, oh, actually the properties are pretty cheap there. You know, which uh, will work for us because we don't have a lot of money. So, um, <clears throat> and at the time, you know, I, I had invested a little bit in silver. Didn't have, I think I might've had a little tiny bit of gold, maybe a one tenth ounce coin or something like that, but it wasn't much. And my wife and I, we had a little bit of silver and um, had saved up some money as well, but very little. And so we came up here to Maine, found a property and 66 acres of land for $18,000. It had been logged recently. That's why it was cheap. And then we had, you know, we bought the land September 2013. And, um, and then we wanted to get a house that we could live in because we couldn't live on the land. There wasn't anything built yet. We were planning to build on the land. And so we found an old house that had been, it was in pre foreclosure. We paid 16,000 for the house. And it was in rough shape, very rough shape. The water lines had all been burst. We had to spend our first winter without heat, um, other than just a little electric heater in a room. The whole rest of the house was not heated. I washed dishes in 18 degree temperatures inside, you know. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, trying to keep the water jugs from freezing and washing dishes when it's that cold is a little rough. But, you know, we would cook food and, and you know, I, we lived cheap. That's the whole point I'm trying to make here. All right, um, from there, we had all the drama of that whole situation or dealing with a neighbor, very wicked, drunken papist neighbor from New York City, <laughs> born and raised there. And, and uh, he was just drunk all the time and always making a problem, always block, blocking our right away to get back to our property, which he wasn't legally allowed to do. And then he died, uh, finally had a chance to witness to the guy when he was sober, flat out rejected the gospel. And I said, okay, I washed my hands. And that was after couple of years of trying to witness to the guy and and um <clears throat> and so we had to sell that property found this property bought this property and um and then we spent another couple of years trying to find a ministry office closer to here because our other ministry office is an hour and a half away to the north the place in bridgewater where we lived for several years i think five years actually <clears throat> um and the whole time uh, when we were in Bridgewater, we had running water, um, regular on-grid type of house. It had a shallow spring in the basement, which was would overflow, and you had to have a sump pump. I'm trying to get this deer fly here. <laughs> and, you know, power outage, you had to hook up a generator to keep the sump pump working or else it would flood the basement. Um, I'm, just the, the trials and everything we went through at that place were insane. Um, we ended up... Uh, when we came down here, we haven't had running water since 2018 when we left up there. So 2020, we bought our current office in the town of Patton. Um, and how have we been able to stay debt free the entire time? Well, very simple. We stayed debt free. We didn't go in. If we don't have money, we don't spend it. And that's a concept most people have kind of missed out on. And I understand, believe me, I understand. It is a very difficult life. Um, you have to make a lot of sacrifices to be debt-free. 
a lot of sacrifices. Is it worth it? I think so. Um, the one thing that I don't like about debt-free living is it's not very efficient sometimes because um, you're doing all this stuff to stay debt-free so that you don't have to go out and borrow money. And sometimes the efficiency is just not there, which is irritating to me. You know, I mean, it keeps me in good shape having to haul water jugs all the time. It's basically a 70 pound water jug in each hand, you know, lifting them into the back of the vehicle and, and carrying them, picking them up out of the back of the vehicle and walking up the steps into the place and walking inside. And so, you know, I do that every couple of days. Um, and, you know, battery powered showers and warming up the water with a uh, wood stove or, you know, there's ways that you can do it. Extreme living. The Bible talks about um, making yourself poor so that you can be rich. And again, that's the big benefit to me of debt-free living is that I, when I buy something, I pay for it once. Okay, there's no interest payments. I don't pay for it, you know, two or three times over. Like if you get a house with a, you know, 30-year mortgage, you're basically paying triple the original purchase price till you get done with all of the interest payments if you go the whole 30 year time period. Um, so uh, just have a couple of points here I've written down. How I became debt free? Well, debt free, debt as a teen paid off before marriage that I already talked about. Uh, I learned to live cheap. And I mean that in every aspect. Uh, I always lived pretty cheaply, pretty frugally. Um, work for room and board which I did at uh, Eldred, Pennsylvania. Um, off-grid living tactics. Even when we were on-grid, we still did off-grid type of living tactics, ways to save money. Um, heating with firewood, instead of trying to go with home heating oil or propane or electric or something like that. Um, two meals a day. We've been eating two meals a day for years. You say, well, that doesn't sound very healthy. How are you getting enough proper nutrition? Well. Here's the way that works. Uh, I don't have health insurance. We've never had health insurance the entire time that we've been married. And the money we save on health insurance, we spend on really good food. So I remember people, you know, somebody at a local grocery store saw us and they commented on a video and all oh, the Denlingers only buy organic food. That's not true. Okay, there's times that we do buy food that's not organic. That's not, you know, real bad to eat and whatever else. We try to buy organic as much as we can, but if the money's not there, we don't do it. But we try to eat um, fresh foods and vegetables and things. We do forage out here. Um, as you can see, the pink flowers back in there, that's fireweed. Uh, we make our own tea from you know, the leaves of the fireweed plant. Very good, actually. It's very good, strong medicinal you know, herbal tea. Um, we do what we can to save money, is the whole point. Don't have health insurance and Put your money into really good food is a big part of what we do. So eating two meals a day, if it's very nutrient dense food, not a problem. It won't affect your health. And of course, you know, you can have our son, he eats three times a day, you know, so we do increase his nutrition because he's growing, you know, I'm not really growing anymore. Um, so 49 years old, I'm not really worried about um, being a big boy when I grow up or something. But, um, so two meals a day, uh, free entertainment, learn to find ways to entertain yourself for free. Uh, that's why we go on hikes. They don't cost us anything. We don't go on big vacations and, you know, thousands of dollars to go make memories. Well, that's fine for some people. And, you know, we'd love to be able to do that certainly, but we just cut that out. That's the way we do it. Um, there are lakes that we can canoe on and kayak on. We look for used canoes or kayaks or really cheap ones. And we've done that. We go fishing, we, which also helps out with making, you know, more food. Um, we'll go catch some fish and, and then we eat that. So there's different ways that you can do that. Um, <clears throat> multiple old vehicles. Uh, you can get older vehicles for fairly cheap. Again, save your money. Don't get into debt get an older vehicle that might not be the prettiest vehicle but as long as it's mechanically sound who cares well what would people think of me oh no get by that you have to get through that of uh, you know i remember hearing somebody made a statement the one time they said 
that Americans are crazy because they, they uh, buy, go into debt to buy vehicles to impress people that they don't even like. Yeah, pretty much. But um, if you have multiple older vehicles, one breaks down, one has an issue, well, okay, then you take another vehicle and you go to the store to get the part to fix the other one. And um, <clears throat> one of the things I would do is, um, I had another thing here on my list, motorcycle, uh, dual sport motorcycle, one that can go on and off road, like a Honda XR650, I had one of those, a, a Suzuki DR650, I had one of those. In our time here in Maine, I actually sold, I had, a, I had bought a brand new KLR650 um, before I got married, and I sold it to buy our place in Bridgewater, um, which was very heartbreaking because I had it all modified and everything just the way I wanted it. I took it on huge road trips and everything. I loved that motorcycle, but I had to sell it. And again, that's another part of this thing. Multiple older vehicles, you can sell one if you need to. You, can, you aren't going to get what you originally paid for it, but you'll get something. It's not the same thing, again, as throwing away your money with having to pay interest payments. Interest will kill your wealth. It's just that simple. You're paying somebody <clears throat> uh, interest payments to pay off a debt that you have to them. They're making money off of you and you're constantly falling behind. That's why you have, you know, my one set of grandparents, they financed things with debt. And when they, when my grandfather passed away, they barely had any money and they had to sell their house just to pay the retirement home. And they, it was a deal where that they would go through that. And if she'd passed away before they used up all the money, then the money would go to the children. And if she passed away after the money was all used up, then the the home would just, they had to keep her there. That was part of the contract. Well, she passed away before or after all the money was used up, so uh, there was no inheritance. Uh, my other grandparents, on the other hand, as far as I know, my Denlinger grandparents, they, I think he financed everything himself. He was debt free. And so he passed away and he had actually had quite a bit of money saved up. I don't know how much and it doesn't matter. I'm not going to say that. It's private. But it was a good amount. And my grandmother lived very comfortably in a retirement home. You know, he provided for her very well. And I remember grandpa always was very simple. He basically wore very similar things, you know, flannel type of shirts, old jeans and things. He was an artist. Would sell his paintings and you know, very simple man. They drove an old AMC Eagle uh, I think Eagle Scout or something like that. But, you know, if you've ever seen an old AMC Eagle, one of the early uh, all-wheel drive cars that uh, Jeep made, actually, back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about and you're curious about it. But that's what they drove. And then after that, they sold it and got a Plymouth Reliant, a K car, if you know anything about those. So um, they lived very cheap. And that frugality um and they had a nice home and everything you know and they weren't just sitting around eating oatmeal at every meal or something like that and they you know they went on vacations they went to different countries and things so they weren't just completely cheap and and whatever else not spending money but you know they learned they taught me to be frugal i got to see their example um and you know, I'm actually a certified motorcycle repair technician. So I did go through the training, so I know how to work on motorcycles better than I know how to work on cars. Motorcycles are cheaper on gas. They can, I had a Yamaha TW200 before I met my wife and that thing got about 80 miles per gallon. <laughs> and it did. I mean, there were times I'd think, I better go out and ride it so the gas doesn't go bad. I mean, it just, it, it rarely ever even used gas. You'd go out on a ride on an afternoon riding around back roads out to dirt roads and things and I'd get back and open up the gas can and look the gas tank and look down in and shake the bike back and forth you know and did it even use any gas <laughs> that thing was so good on gas so my advice to younger men out there um, get into the thing of dual sports uh, you can save a lot of money I had a friend years ago that uh, had a dual sport I got him into the whole thing taught him how to ride on my TW200 actually um, we'd go out, he'd be on the back, I'd be on the front, and we'd go out to a back roads or something, I'd hop off and say, okay, here's how you shift and whatever else. And I taught him how to ride, and he went and he got a Suzuki DR200, and he'd ride the thing to work and, you know, everything else. 
he was riding it out on the you know highway and people going 70 miles an hour and he's <laughs> going about uh, 55 and he said I think I want to kind of graduate to a 650 or something which he did but he rode it year-round snow and everything he was crazy but to save a lot of money and he was able to work on the bike himself so um, some good advice for a young man out there uh, you want to go back and forth to a job or something uh, learn to get into motorcycles they're very cheap um, easy to work on even a 650 motorcycle you'll still hit probably 40 to 50 miles per gallon as long as you're not doing wheelies and smoky tire burnouts or something like that <laughs> but um and even atvs you move out to a country area like this you can actually ride four wheelers on the roads in many areas and they won't say anything they don't care as long as you're not you know being crazy with the thing and we used to do that when we were at bridgewater we would go over to our property at littleton completely on atv trails and ride on the road a little bit everything was fine so uh, we put quite a few miles on ATVs. I still have the one, Kawasaki Brute Force. It's in some of my old videos way back. But um, <clears throat> good utility four-wheeler. And again, it's a when you have a multiple older vehicles as a way to remain debt-free, you can use, in worst-case scenario, you can use your ATV, which I've done different times. Okay, everything's broken down right now. This one needs a new starter. This one needs a new battery. This one, I have to change the oil. Really shouldn't drive it anymore. Okay, ride the four-wheeler. And of course, we have a snowmobile here for winter time. A used one. Go to a dealership. Go look on Craigslist. Um, look at people's front yards. Oh, there's a snowmobile. Pull over. How much do you want for it? Um, I want $2,500. You say, oh man, I don't have that much money. I have $1,800. Would you sell it for $1,800? Offer less price. This place here was $70,000. I offered fifty-five, dollars um, And they took it. So um, we did very well on the property. Lord blessed us with it. And again, pray before you, you offer this kind of money. And you just simply say, Lord, if you want me to have this motorcycle, if you want me to have this property, if you want me to have this camper, this name it, then please give me a good deal on it. Don't get into the thing of just, I'll pay full price. I mean, again, my father taught me that. Um, I remember we actually went to, there was a foot locker at a Park City Center where I grew up. And um, I don't even, it's probably not even there yet. I have no idea. I think they went out of business or something, but maybe, maybe not. I don't know. If you know, you can leave it in the comments down below. Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Park City Center. Is foot locker still there? I don't know. But I uh, went into this Foot Locker and I wanted this, this pair of Nike sneakers, you know, for when I was in high school. And my father said, let me see if I can get them for a better price. <laughs> and he's there, you know, going up and, and uh, yeah, you know, I see that they're, you know, $75. But um, would you be willing to take 50 <laughs> He would do it to anybody. And, um, and that's how you get ahead. That's how you have an advantage. You say, okay, I'm able to save some money here. And, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned. Again, understand those, that old way of thinking. Um, my first car, like I said, was a Plymouth Champ, and it was manual transmission. A lot of kids don't even know how to drive manual transmission anymore. My Beetle was manual, tra manual transmission. My Plymouth Champ was manual transmission. My Ford Ranger was manual transmission. I prefer manual transmission. But that Plymouth Champ, um, I remember there were so many times I learned the old trick of you get to a hill and you shift it into neutral and you just coast down the hill and you see how far you can coast, you know? And we'd be in there, you know, pushing things. You know, trying, it doesn't do anything, but you know, in our minds, you know, we're trying to get, you know, and we would have competitions, you know, see who can, if you can coast and get down the hill and up that, through that valley and up the next hill. And you know, you'd be getting up to the top of the hill going, your speed's dropping down and dropping down because you're not using any gas, you know, it's just idle speed. And, uh, and, you know, we'd see who, if you could coast, get enough speed to go down the hill and coast and get up over the little next knob. And, you know, you'd be doing 10 miles an hour before you'd crest over the hill. Yeah, I made it. You know, that's the way I was raised. My friends and I, we would do that type of thing. Why? To save a few cents on gas. Um, learn to coast, learn to put things in neutral and whatever. Now, you know, I'd be careful if it's an automatic because you can go too far and hit reverse or something. Then you're going to be needing a new transmission. So be careful on that one. 
but um, find ways to save money. You say, well, scientifically, this doesn't make any sense. The amount of money that you would save is just so minimal. And Oh, not when you add everything up. I remember seeing a video. They put a whole bunch of pennies on the sidewalk, and then they did a hidden camera thing, and most people just stepped over top of it. And this one guy uh, went over, and he crouched down, and he's putting these pennies in his pocket, you know, whatever. And they came up to him, and they said, why did you stop? And everybody else is walking by. And he said, because I know the value of money. And they said, well, you know, it took you about, you know, two minutes to get all those pennies in your pocket. And they said, you made X amount of money, which was actually more than most people make by just taking the time to pick up some change. So, but I guess, you know, with the central bank digital currency thing, then there will, that will never happen again. You can't just walk along through a parking lot and, oh, you know, there's a coin or something. It'll just be, you know, floating out there in the uh, cloud or something, the internet cloud. I remember being a boy and went to a, a Kmart, East Town Mall in uh, Lancaster County and they had, it was winter time and they had snowed or they piled, you know, plowed all these, and there were these big snow piles and things and we always want to play King of the Mountain where you get up on top and then the other children try to get to the top and you shove them down and, and if they, if you get knocked down then you're no longer King of the Mountain, you know, it's what we would play as children. And um, <clears throat> we were, so we were climbing up this snow pile and it had, you know, the snow had melted somewhat, you know, the pile had melted a little bit and we're climbing up and I and all of a sudden I look on this pile and there's a quarter. Wow, there's a quarter. I look over here, there's a dime. There's a nickel over that way. There's a penny over here. There's another quarter. And it was this whole thing because the people, you know, they go to get in their vehicle, they put their hand in their car to get their or in their pocket to get their keys, and they have change in there from being in the store, and the change falls out, hits the parking lot, and they're either too lazy to pick it up or they don't hear it. And so there's just change all over these parking lots. At least there was back when people paid with cash. And so this snow pile was just covered in coins. And so we're just climbing all over this snow pile. And, um, you know, when I was a boy, my, my uh, uncle, Uncle Don Denlinger, had red caboose in. Uh, it's in the Guinness Book of World Records, the most cabooses in one location. And he, you know, converted these cabooses into motel rooms you could stay in a caboose for the night um which we stayed different times there over the years and uh, at uncle don's place and <clears throat> he had this gift shop type of area and he had this wooden deck you know and there was different you know vending machines and different things and and um people would you know get a go to get a coin out and they would drop it and it would go down through the cracks of the wooden deck there and oh lost a coin and they'd go for more you know whatever Every time we go over there to Red Caboose, we'd crawl underneath the deck and we'd go back there. It's probably four feet up off the ground, you know, so it wasn't that we were crawling on our stomachs or anything. But we'd crawl back underneath and we'd pick up all the quarters and all the other coins. And then we would go buy stuff from the vending machines ourselves. Or if we had enough, we'd go into the gift shop where my grandmother worked and we'd get things there. So lots of little stories here for you. But um, heat a room, not a house, another concept. If you live in a northern environment, learn to heat a room and not the entire house. Um, our place in town, um, it has a nice new oil furnace. It's got a, the oil tank is from Germany. You know, they put a lot of money into the thing. But in order for me to be able to heat the whole place in the winter, I'd have to be hooked up to town water, which is toxic. They have uh, fluoride and chlorine in it. And they advise you not to drink it and whatever else. You can bathe in it, but those don't drink it not safe but I don't want to pay for the town water that's more money and I don't want to pay for home heating oil and there's no way that I can zone it just for heating certain rooms it would have to be heating the whole place I'm just not going to do that so what we've done is we use electric heaters to heat single individual rooms and we also have a, a rocket stove that we heat the one room with and things wood stove that we can come out and we can cut smaller wood and use it for the rocket stove um, and we have a tiny house here on the property that's on wheels so it's not technically a house and um and we might build on the property eventually or get rid of the tiny house or i don't know at this point in time but um that's another thing that you can do and another one that i have here on the list is precious metals like i said we had silver when we first came here to maine we sold all of our silver 
It was a good price back then. It was right around $40, I think, an ounce that we got for it years ago. And um, we knew the guys at the coin shop, they gave us a good deal. And um, <clears throat> I think it was Security Coin out near Lancaster City. And I don't know if they're still around or not. But um, we came here with that money and with other money that we were able to scrape together, selling my motorcycle and, and whatever. Again, having physical assets is so important when you're debt-free. Things that you can sell if you need to. That's how you build wealth. And precious metals, it's not an investment that you say, I'm going to buy, get into precious metals so I can make huge amounts of money when it doubles or triples. It's not actually doubling or tripling, it's actually the currency going down. So, but it is a way to preserve your money, preserve your wealth, so to speak. So that's another good thing to get into. Um, and uh, move to a low cost area. That's the last thing on my list. If you can't afford to live in your area, then look outside of your area. And you're going to have to go out of your comfort zone there. And I mean, we did. Um, my wife left. Uh, where she was raised, I left where I was raised. And you know, for me, my ancestors came to the area where I lived and a, literally the very first Denlinger homestead was built a few miles from where I grew up. So, you know, it was a shocking thing for us to move to Maine, you know. Um, but I had other, some of my other siblings have moved to other states as well because Pennsylvania got too unaffordable. And so you say, well, brother Brian, I can't afford anything in my area. Then look to move to another area. And it's a big thing and you have to, the upheaval of it all and, you know, getting away from what you're familiar with and moving to a new area where you don't know anybody. Yeah, it's challenging. It's very challenging. A log truck coming up the road you can hear. Uh, there's actually a dump truck, but whatever. Um, but, you know, you'll get to know people. The Lord will provide. And what you do is you go to a place and that's cheap and learn to survive there. So um, is it possible to live debt free without much money? Absolutely. Uh, we've done it for years. But it's a, it's a lifetime accumulation thing. It's not something that you just say, I'm going to try this for a month and then I'll quit if it doesn't work. No. Yeah, it's a lifestyle. It's a change of your mind saying, if I can't afford it, I'm not going to buy it. And I'm just not going to care what people think about me. Um, I want to be debt free. So hopefully you've learned something. I'll put links at the end here to the off-grid seminar. There's a lot of cheap things that you can do to live off-grid. And again, you don't have to be off-grid permanently or something. Um, and just, I'll just struggle for the rest of my life, you know. No, uh, we live in a tiny house, but um, that will change. Tiny house living doesn't have to be permanent. Um, just learn the old ways of doing things. Saving up, you know, learn to darn your socks. Learn to mend your clothing. Um, wear things out. Uh, use things. You know, I'll show you one thing here before I shut down. Um, I bought this truck and I used it for years. It was fine to drive and the salt, salty roads of northern Maine destroyed it. And now it's a plow truck. It's graduated. It's gone from being a nice newer vehicle to now it's all rusted out. You can see right here and you should see underneath it's even worse. But it's gone from being a drive on the road truck to now a work truck. And as long as it runs, I'll keep it as a work truck. If I ever have to sell it, well, I can get a little bit for it and whatever, but there was never any debt on that truck. Okay, um, you've seen this in videos too, an old school bus right here. And we cooked in this school bus. I had a wood cook stove. Right here's where I had the stove pipe coming out. And this window right here, I had this down. I had a piece of galvanized metal in it, a pipe coming out and up. And we cooked for a whole, actually two years in this thing. And the only reason I took it apart was because we were trying to help a family. I had them staying over that way and it didn't work out. But um, again, got a used old wood cook stove. Cooked in there with all the mosquitoes and everything else. Uh, I lost so much blood that one summer <laughs> and we cooked completely off grid for a whole year. No electricity at all. Cooked with wood for a whole year. Um, and what did we do? Saved money. 
Um, that's the way you do it. Uh, learn not to spend. Learn to save. Um, learn to live very frugally. And you can live a life of great adventure as well with it. It's not some kind of a thing of just, oh, it's terrible and miserable. It's an exciting adventure. It really is. So, or you can just go out and borrow money and get yourself into debt and constantly live under that threat of what if I can't make my payment this month. I know, I used to be in that. Um, I remember it. And I'm glad I'm away from it. So, that is going to be it. Like I said, hopefully you've learned some things. Videos here at the end for you to watch to give you some more, uh, enter more not entertainment, some more education on this matter. So that will be it. See you in the next video.